This is Linux Unplugged, episode 28 for February 18th, 2014. Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's still riding high from episode 300 of the Linux Action Show. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hello there, sir. Hello, Matt. Hello. We've been enjoying quite a good uh, quite a good amount of feedback, a lot of positive feedback about the announcement of our new show, How To Linux, which you're going to be hearing more about soon on, Jup- on, on all fine Jupiter Broadcasting programming, mm-hmm. I'm sure. Well, it's just so cool to see so many people so excited about something new like that. So that's, that's really gratifying. Thank you, everybody. Now, look, we got a good show coming up today right here on Unplugged. Later on, towards the end of the show, we're going to do a giveaway. We're going to give away some games from, some, from for the trivia that we uh, we announced in uh, episode 300 of Linux Action Show. So we'll get that taken care of. We got some really good feedback about getting uh, the younger generation into Linux. And also, we're going to bring on Michael Hall. He works at Canonical as, get this, Matt, the Upstream Liaison. Ooh, oh, that, right on. Yeah, that's so, you know, like, could you imagine like you're at a bar and somebody says, so what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm an upstream liaison. That's that a great title. Cool. Yeah, I mean, that's a great title. So we're going to bring him on because he just had a recent post today. Uh, I guess he's been doing a, a, essentially a blog a day and uh, he's calling it a new 80-20 rule for open source. Uh, he says, put simply, the rule says that people will tend to appreciate it more when you give them 20% of something and resent you if you give them 80%. He says, I know, it sounds completely counterintuitive, but that's what I was seeing in all the conversations around Mozilla and, say, things around Canonical and Ubuntu. People, by and large, were saying that the reason Canonical and Mozilla were being judged so harshly was because they already did most of what people wanted, which made them resent when they didn't do everything. (laughs) What a great point. And I got to tell you, I think that's something you and I have some thoughts on. Definitely. I think that it, I think there's multiple tiers to it, but I think the meat and potatoes of it is definitely that people do develop an expectation surrounded with what they're presented with initially. So back when I was doing a lot of free Linux questions, I had people that were really upset if I didn't respond within a certain period of time Mm -hmm. or if I didn't have time to respond at all. I mean, they would really feel offended. And I think that certainly translates as true as in this space as well. Yeah, and I could totally see how software developers find themselves in this position, especially in an open community. So we'll talk about that coming up in the show. Uh, and then if we have a little time, I've got a couple other topics we're going to jump to, as well as I want to help uh, a fellow uh, Linux Unplugged audience member who had a hard drive uh, kind of give out on him recently. Oh, ooh, yeah. I always feel bad for that. I know. Mm. So maybe we'll pick the mumble room uh, and see what uh, see what they what they think we could do for him. But first, let's start with our feedback uh, from last week's episode. We like to try to keep a thread going between all of the episodes. So that way, if you uh, listen continuously, you kind of get a payoff there because we're not episodic. We're not getting uh, we're Ew. not going to get some big deal from the networks like Star Trek The Next Generation to where they couldn't have a, a nice storyline. No, no, sir. Here we have storyline. And our first email comes in from Extraordinary Ben. He says, hey, Chris, Matt and Chase. Oh, look at this. Chase is nice. getting emails now. <laughs> He's Good in. Deal. Like the community is like, give him a big <laughs> hug. That is awesome. He's doing an AMA right now in the in the Linux Action Show subreddit, too, if uh uh, if uh, you guys have any questions for him. He says, hi, my name is Ben, and I'm a fellow Washingtonian. Ooh, nice, Ben. Uh, he says, by the way, since there's other Bens in the IRC, you should probably just call me Extraordinary Ben. First off, I want to thank you guys for all of the effort you put into making such an awesome content on Jupiter Broadcasting. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I was very excited when you announced the new how-to Linux show you're planning. This is just the kind of thing the Linux community needs for newcomers or those who want to improve their skills in Linux. I was really surprised with the timing of your announcement because I was just thinking about starting a website for Linux users that would be a repository of guides, how-tos, and whatnot for people to search, update, and contribute articles to. Similar to how DigitalOcean has one for their community, but it would contain everything from customizing GNOME themes to setting up your own firewall. Of course, this would probably be a far too great of a task to take on my own, but with the new show coming into play, I think a community-organized effort would make it possible. Uh, he goes on to say, if we had a site like this to complement the show, I think it would be a huge benefit for everyone. I'd love to hear what you guys think from the JB community of this idea. Extraordinary Ben. So, you know, we hadn't really mm. talked about this, but I do see value in something like this. I think this is a great mm-hmm. idea. So, Extraordinary Ben, we should chat more. And I'd love to hear uh, all ideas you guys have 
for the how-to show. We're going to have in the future, as the show gets uh, probably really just the next week or two, you'll see these prop up in the uh, Linux Action Show subreddit. We'll start up some threads looking for your ideas and your feedback. So keep thinking of this kind of stuff, and we'll have some outlets for you to bring those in. Um, and then also, uh, you know, we'll, as the show starts, we'll incorporate your feedback and any ideas you have like that. I think having like a web resource, though, is a really great idea. So thanks, Extraordinary Ben. I'm not quite sure how we'd pull that off because the podcast production itself is such a, a task that I don't know about <laughs> also Boy, updating a website, but it seems really valuable. Yeah. I, I think that if it was done with the under, if it was done, first of all, wiki style, I think that would be the first thing, which help. means that it's done by the community um, that we're, we're hands off. It's up to you guys. I think if something like that was to take place to where it was based off show notes and basically what was observed, perhaps, I don't know. That's going to be tough though. Yeah. We'll chat more. I think that's yeah. worth. I think that's worth. I think it's a great idea, and I'd like to hear the, what the community thinks about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so Tom writes in, and this was really the topic last week that I thought really got the most traction as far as our feedback goes. And we got a lot of emails in about this, so I picked a couple that I came across, and some other ones I didn't get to all of them. But so Tom wrote. He said, "This week uh, you had a younger listener write in about their experiences, and I thought I might add my perspective. I'm a slightly older than your writer. I'm 17, but I've been doing the same sort of thing since I was younger." I'd experienced similar problems in education. My teacher is poor, is so poor, and I don't think he means in the money sense, I think he means uh -huh. in the talent right. sense, yeah, that yeah. it's turned into a running joke. There are at least three people in my class of 16 who could teach a, teach a, teach better, two of which are JB listeners, that's awesome. Nice. Even worse, the curriculum for my computing A level is unimaginably out of touch. For example, the operating system chapter is more about obscure batch processing systems and considers operating systems which can multitask as notable then about topics relevant to this decade. Uh, wow. I think that this there is no chance of people being taught useful grounding in schools here in England without substantial change. However, I have found that a very large number of my peers religiously follow gaming subreddits and Valve. With the Snowden revelations and Steam coming to Linux, I have noticed many more people asking of me to recommend a distro to try. Very interesting. Thank you all for all the hard work you do and amazing shows. Uh, one Jupiter Broadcasting Show is more educational than a, much, a month of my A-level classes. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Double win for you. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, that, I, I, I felt like... So this is one of the reasons um, that I have been a, a proponent of gaming coming to Linux. Uh, not because I like promoting a platform that you, you know sells commercial games that are restricted by DRM. That is not my... Uh, you know, that's that's not oh, I would, what, how I would prefer it. But I believe... That um, humans are like sh they like shiny things, and they will oh, yeah. they will ch I, I they will go to a lot of efforts to have a great gaming experience, right? And it's fun for them. It, it becomes a mission. It becomes a quest to have the ultimate gaming experience, to have the most frame rates, to have the best sound, uh, all yeah. of this, to and to have your system be the most performant possible. And I think this is why gaming is important for desktop Linux, even though the vast majority of Linux users today do not find themselves that interested by the gaming topic. Boy, boy. You know, I think you pretty much nailed it. I definitely think that. Because I know for myself, I try to limp along with, uh, with my older experiences, my older computers and whatnot. But, I, but I'm always yearning for that next greatest, latest thing. I want the fastest phone. I want the best computer. So I think you really nailed it. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, if, if, Steam, if Steam OS and Linux become a, a even, you know, a, a good option and, mm -hmm. and Microsoft keeps cocking it up with Windows, I mean, the two will come to meet. And people will be driven. And then you have all these other ancillary issues like privacy and the cost right. and, and reinvestment in hardware and all these kinds of things that also push people towards Linux. So I, I'm, I'm positive in the freedom dimension about Linux's potentials, even when it's being used to play proprietary games, because I believe the benefit of bringing more people to use Linux just, just to get people on the desktop will improve the Linux desktop situation on a whole. So even though the, what might have brought them, I guess what I'm trying to, the way to summarize this is what, what might have brought them might have been that proprietary game that has DRM mm -hmm. that they paid money for, but then they end up staying in an open source ecosystem. And I think that's, that's, that's the important part for the long run. Well, I think so. That really could translate into they came for the really fancy microbrew beer, and they, you know, and they stayed <laughs> for the cheap stuff and the camaraderie of the folks around them. Yeah, well, right? cheap or uh, cheap, well, cheap or, or uh, low cost. Uh, yeah, didn't, you yeah. Know, <laughs> however you want to put it. I'm yeah, not saying right. low, low rent, right. but low cost. You know. <laughs> I like anytime we can try to uh, uh, get this Related close to a group. beer analogy because Washington's <laughs> got some great micro brews. So I would love to do an episode of Linux Unplugged at a microbrewery, even though it's completely unrelated to Linux. I just I want to do it. 
So if you are in the area in Washington and you have a microbrewery and you listen to this show, you should probably get a hold of us. Email us. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and click that contact link. I want to do a show from your brewery. I don't care if the sound's going to be bad, uh, but I would like to drink a little bit of your beer. Just a little bit. I can't drink a lot because I the gluten. But Are, we, are we air quoting a little bit? Or are we? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Oh, well, little is a, you know, that's hey, there's, some, term. there's some flexibility in its definition, sure. you might say. Uh, all right, Matt. Well, uh, before we go into our next email, uh, which is uh, really a great stretch of a couple of emails we'll get to, uh, I want to thank DigitalOcean. Oh, yeah. DigitalOcean is one of our sponsors for Linux Unplugged. And DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up your own cloud server that you have root login to. Users can create a cloud server in 55 seconds, although I believe the record right now is 44 seconds. If anybody beats that, you got to let us know. But the record right now is 44 seconds. But here's the best part. Pricing plans start at $5 per month for 512 megs of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte, yeah, a terabyte of transfer. Now, what you can do with these is endless because they have Ubuntu droplets you can deploy. They have Arch, CentOS, everything you might want like that. They have ones preloaded with the LAMP stack, preloaded with Docker, etc. You can create your own snapshots, back them up, redeploy them as you need them. Uh, I just heard from uh, somebody in our chat room today who used it to set up their own private uh, XMPP server. So they have their own private chat server, right? I'm using it for BitTorrent Sync and I just set up a uh, paste bin alternative, an open source PHP based paste bin al- alternative that I might talk about in a future Linux action show. I just tossed it up on my DigitalOcean Arch server and it's been awesome. They have a great connection, tier one bandwidth. Paired with those SSDs, it really sings. DigitalOcean has data ca- data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Amsterdam, and now Singapore. With that simple and intuitive control panel, you'll be whipping right through there. And good news, if you're a power user, you can actually replicate the functionality with their straightforward API. Build your own commands. Build your own interface if you need to. I'll now, tell you what, you yeah. know, you bundle this with, we were talking earlier about Jitsi and uh, Jitsi's video bridge right. and uh, Jitmeet and whatnot. You can run this on one of these bad boys. Yeah, perfect. And you could essentially have your own Skype. It'd be a perfect too for a web RTC control mm-hmm. server. Uh, look, go play with it because we have a special offer for you. Use the promo code Linux Unplugged February. Yeah, Linux Unplugged February. That's all one word. You'll get a $10 credit over at DigitalOcean by using Linux Unplugged February. Now, if you use the $5 machine, which I've been using for months now, months. If you use the $5 machine, you're going to get two months for free. They got tons of great technology powered by KVM sitting on top of SSD hard drives, tier one bandwidth, global image transfer, private networking in certain data centers, an easy to use control panel, DNS management, resizing a server in a single click, backup and snapshots, a web console, one click application install, two factor authentication, (laughs) and a fantastic developer community. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code Linux Unplugged February. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. All right. Oh. Let's continue on this thread that uh, we were talking about with uh, the younger audience um, getting into getting into Linux and how they're kind of up against a, a lot of odds right now. Daniel Roney says, I don't think that Linux literacy is specific to today's generation. Illiteracy, I should say. It has always been like this. It was, it was the same back in the days when I was in school. People in general are not interested in how stuff works, just that it does work. Mm-hmm. This is changing, though. Before, it was practically impossible to find any 14-year-old doing Linux anywhere. Now, there are a couple of them in every city. They might not they might be alone in their school, but overall, there are more youngsters doing it than before. Steam will change this too, and it'll become even more common in the generations to come. Schools are not doing Linux because it's not perceived as common enough, which is true. Most workplaces do Microsoft and Office and its Office suite, and as long as this is true, schools will not change. They are supposed to give kids enough basic knowledge to be able to handle a word processor, and that's what they do. I don't agree with this, but it's the logic behind it. Chromebooks and Google Docs are changing this now. The future will not be desktops, tablets, or even phones. It will be the Internet of Things. Oh, oh, buzzword. Oh, uh, yes. Just like the Intel Edison, an SD, an SD card-sized computer, which is about as strong as a Pentium 4. Think about it. A couple of generations of that, and you could make anything a phone. It's a good point. I think that's a really good point. And, and I think that he nailed it when he said there's always going to be a couple of people out of every town that are running Linux. I walk into uh, my local grocery store with my, my rocking new sweatshirt. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you, I had a couple of people. They didn't, uh, one person did recognize the show and kind of freaked out a little bit. No the other way. Person, really cool. Yeah. The, the other person recognized the penguin in the Linux. Oh, yeah. You know, and yeah. I thought that was kind of cool too. So it's like, it's, it's awesome that, um, you know, 
it all takes is a couple people to really help help the growth happen, I think. Yeah, and you know? I think too, like uh, we are stuck in an old generation's way of thinking where, you know, Microsoft and, and we're thinking in the old paradigm. Yes. Uh, and I think school districts are and, and, you know, all of the people that they're making decisions on curriculum are. But the reality is, and this is why I've been, this is really what makes me excited about Linux is not what it is today, but the fact that as as technology becomes more general purpose and and these market leaders who were creating these specific uh, technology empires like AIX and System 390, etc., as they begin to fade, the general purpose technology that is cheaper to implement is more economical, more people have expertise on it, is easily deployable, it has a lot of flexibility. That type of technology replaces those special one-off tiered types of technologies and Linux eventually ends up everywhere. And this Internet of Things is a cute way of, of calling it that, but that's what it is. And Linux will become relevant because everything will be running Linux that is a general technology component. And right. I think it's going to take a long time for schools to sort of work in how that's incorporated in, into their into their curriculum. And maybe it's maybe it's through things like more like using the web browser and things like that. I don't I don't know exactly, but what what we have today is a reflection of the old computer industry and for better or worse that industry is going through major redefinitions. I just read a stat recently that uh, average Joe and Jane American, like 70% of their computing now is done on their quote unquote tablets or smart devices. Isn't that wild? I mean, when you really, because you hear it and it kind of, you know, you don't really think anything it doesn't seem it. possible. Then, right. But then you see it happen. You're walking right. down the street, you go to a, a, maybe a, I don't know, a doctor's office and you see tablets and phones everywhere. Right. It's like they're, a lot of these people are doing work from these devices. When you think about it, because the availability is higher, so they've always got it. Right, they've always got it with them, so they exactly. can whip it out. So there's more. There's the 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 frequency goes up because they're whipping it out, Matt. They're just whipping it out, they're whipping it out. That thing is flopping around <laughs> all over the place. And I'll tell you, those tablets and phones are in action, folks. That's right. Uh, but they're also they're they're simpler and they're easier and they're faster in a lot of senses, and they have less trouble. So there's less resistance to just oh, I'll just grab it and check the Facebook feed real quick. And it does make sense. And maybe those computing activities that they're doing on those devices aren't all that important. They're not creating something. You know, there's not they're not developing something, but it's still usage. And I think at the end of the day, that's what has Microsoft freaked out right now. Oh, yeah. All right. Our last bit of feedback this week comes in from Dakota. Dakota writes in about Linux in schools uh, and uh, says, I'm 15 years old and have been using Linux for a year now. I've done stuff from write my own code to compiling a custom kernel on Ubuntu. I think we as a community should start a petition to get open source into more schools. And like you talked about on Unplugged with the same other teens, I think the school should actually teach you something useful if computer in the computer and IT classes. It's really sad when there are kids out there like me who can teach the class better than the teacher. You know, that sentiment, um, of teaching the class better than the teacher, which can come across a little bit like the youngster knowing more than the, than the, than the teacher and, you know, these damn kids. But in the same sense, like, <laughs> I remember one of the reasons I wasn't super spun up about taking more... Um, college level courses is because I, I quickly felt like I was outflanking my teachers and knew more than they did. And it was frustrating when right. the teacher would incorrectly cover something or say something wrong or use the wrong terminology or, you know, write system D with a capital D or, you know, bad example, but you know what I'm saying? Like it, it, it is very frustrating for these students. Uh, so, and, and it's interesting because we got a lot more emails than the ones I just read on air and a lot of them iterated that point. And, and there's a frustration like there a trend of young people uh, saying, hey, you know, don't don't give up on our generation. We're here. We're talking. We're sharing. We're teaching others that are willing to learn. Maybe yeah. not the teachers, but, right. you know, certainly other students. I'm almost coming to the conclusion that I think the future of Linux on the desktop in a non-enterprise situation, perhaps at home, will be with young people. I think that they, much like how Firefox had its adoption spread, I think it's going to be young people that make it happen. Interesting. Like mom and dad screwed up the computer. Right. Let right. me replace the OS with something that works. Right. That Just like of. they used to with the browser. Be like, oh, mom and dad you're not using Firefox. This is what your problem is. Let me fix that for you. you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know what? You might be right about that, Matt. Uh, I, it's still I would, early days. I would say, too, when I think about this, you know, looking at these these kids that are really smart, uh, I think that really there's two things that uh, we have to realize is that uh, younger Linux users will find resources that we have out there for the adults, like these shows. Like these shows, like when we make these, you know, we don't really have a specific age group in mind, but 
we're definitely not trying to target a younger demographic, but yet they still obviously we have an audience that repre- that they you know they represent a percentage of the audience that's that's noticeable, and they are finding the same resources that we create for adults. And I don't think we have to get in this mindset that we have to do something very special for the kids. I think smart, savvy kids that are told it is okay, self-education is an, old, is an okay thing. If we can, you know, because a lot of kids, I felt when I was in school, I felt that the internet was new, right? And it was mm-hmm. untrusted. And there was pushback from my teachers when I would self-research and self-educate. Like, right. you can't rely on that. You don't know if you're teaching yourself the right thing. You're not smart enough to figure it out on your own. You need our guidance is really what they were saying. And I now looking back on that, I resent that because self-education is a fantastic tool and the internet empowers people to teach themselves things on their own in their own room, don't you think? I think that's. I think you really nailed on something there, even bigger than just uh, the experiences that you had. I think the, the problem is, is it was a cha- it represented the changing of a guard to where – it was no longer teachers who were the teachers, essentially. I right. mean, they no longer were the power player or had all the knowledge that there's this new uh, new fang, uh, finagled thing that kids were, quite frankly, more adept to than the adults were. Um, I was, at that time when this was happening, I was pretty much out of my own and out of school and whatnot, but I witnessed this happening a lot just in society, that there seemed to be a real shift. And so I think that that's probably a lot of what you were experiencing. Yeah, and I think maybe that could still be there. Could be a little bit of that still in mm-hmm. play today, um, yes. because some of those same teachers are still in, and <laughs> yeah, they uh, really are, aren't they? Yeah. So I think you know if we tell these if we tell these uh, teenagers and kids that hey, you know, dude and do that, it's fine. Go out there and learn on your own. You, you go teach yourself. You don't have to have somebody's blessing to become educated on a topic. That's right. So all right, so that that wraps up our uh, our uh, specific email feedback. But I did have a little. Valve update. Uh, so we've been covering the evolving Valve story here on Linux Unplugged, and uh, big story broke out this this last in the, actually just a couple of days ago uh, that uh, Valve was apparently monitoring people's DNS cache and then parsing out where you've gone. Now, anybody in the mumble room, did you catch this whole story where Valve was supposedly looking at people's... First it came out, Valve was looking at your browsing history, right? And they were monitoring your browsing history, and then it came, okay, okay, oh, they're not monitoring your browsing history, they're looking at your DNS cache. Did you guys hear this story? Anybody here familiar with this? Yes, and also he went. uh, Gabe went to Reddit to kind of set it straight. Now, that was the interesting twist here. Uh, So, uh, the way... So, just to fill some of you guys in on the the background... uh, I guess Valve has been in this cold war, not even a cold war, a war with these these cheats. Uh, he wrote, uh, Gabe wrote on uh, on Reddit, there are a number of kernel level paid paid cheats relative to this Reddit thread. And he links to the thread about a bunch of these kernel level cheats where like in Windows, it's almost like, you know, it's almost like malware in a sense. He says, cheat developers have a problem getting cheaters to actually pay them for all the obvious reasons. So they start creating their own DRM and anti-cheat codes for their own cheats. The, che- <laughs> yeah, the cheats phone home to a DRM server that confirms that the cheater is actually paid to use the cheat. Now, they have this program called VAC, V-A-C. It's a checker for the presence of these cheats. If they, if the... If they were detected, VAC then checked to see which cheat DRM server was being contacted. Now, here's how they do it, and this is the part that got people upset. The second check was done by looking at a partial match to those cheat DRM servers in the DNS cache. If found, then hashes of the matching DNS entries were sent to the VAC servers. The matches double checked on our server. This is Gabe talking, and the mm-hmm. client then marked it for a. Then the client was then marked for a future ban. He says, by the way, less than one percent of clients, ten, uh, less than a tenth of one percent of clients triggered the second check. Um, but this was, but well, hey, so wait a minute, Valve's been checking my DNS cache and then doing hashes of it. I didn't know It's like know they this. only read part of that, right? But, I mean, they're not getting the deeper reasoning, so it's interesting. It appears like there's a really big back and forth thing going on here. And I, I just wondered, did anybody, in the, did anybody in the mumble room feel like Valve has crossed a line by doing this uh, DNS cache checking? Um, no. It, it was kinda... first reported, but then when it was explained, it, it wasn't as bad as it first seemed. Yeah. 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 The Especially... whole thing is... Go ahead, Rod. People, th- people thought that his the, the, they were checking it. So if you just happened to go to the server, you would get banned. But the the double the second check is what uh, explained that it wasn't doing that. So even if you went to the servers for the ch- cheat, you weren't being uh, logged for doing it. Okay, yeah, and I mean it's a hash too of the DNS cache. Is that what you were going to say, Webby? Web Wizard? Uh, no, I was uh, just going to like they. I think they really needed to go and just be more. Th- 
more uh, forthcoming so that when people go and say, oh, look at what I found, and then everyone just explodes, start pointing fingers saying, oh, yeah. I must be doing something bad. Well, I mean, before we go too far, I mean, Crash, don't you think that uh, people are just kind of taking Valve on their word on this whole thing a little too much? That's that's exactly what I was just going to say, is that Gabe went and made a statement um, in which he basically said, well, you know, you've, you've got to trust us and we don't want to break your trust and... Um, yeah, trust us, just like yeah, Obama like, says. He, he, he <laughs> yeah, basically right. said, "Trust us," because if you know, if, if we were doing something bad, how would that look for us and everything? But at the moment, all we have is his word right. that that's all it's doing, and that it isn't going to be used for anything worse. Which okay, there's no evidence that it is doing anything worse, but we also know that the capability to scan your DNS cache and send hashes of it exists in their software that only they can control. Because they send updates to Steam and they're all closed source and there's nothing you you can't check those to make sure that it isn't doing anything else. Mm, so mm -hmm. we've got Gabe's word and he seems like a trustworthy guy, but how do we know that? I mean, lots of people seem trustworthy before the Snowden leaks came out. So, fate. What do you think this means for our state of privacy? Well, I mean, maybe it's just this constant state of are talking about it, but there's so many companies that are ripping off your data online now. Not to, I mean, Google's the big player there. That Valve seems like a pretty reputable company, and at least for me, I think I'm going to take them at their word until I see reason not to, just because they're, it's just so prevalent nowadays that, I mean, you can't just lock yourself in a room and not connect to the internet. That's true. Well, Ick, it sounds like you think this was a this is a little bit of came down to disclosure versus PR, but could Valve really properly disclose this without then then disclosing to the to the cheaters how they're checking and catching them? Well, not exactly. What I'm thinking is, it, you know, if they would just disclose that there could be the possibility of something like this happening, just a little bit of disclosure can solve a whole slew of the PR problems that would happen in the wake of that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. I mean, I'm glad. Why does the operating system let it happen? Well, that's right? a, like, that's a great why, question. Why is there functionality to look in the DNS cache and see what's there? Maybe to retrieve like something it, from the cache, like if you want. That to doesn't make any sense. Like you, the whole it's supposed to be transparent, right? You go to look something up, and if it's cache hit, yay! But why should you be able to see what other programs right. you've been looking up? Yeah, you could be. Maybe you can specifically look one particular thing up, but you shouldn't be able to see what all of the entries are. Right. Well, you look something up and you might be able to tell by how fast the result comes back, whether it was a cache hit or not, as like a timing attack. Right. But you shouldn't be able to just see what's in the cache. And I'm yeah. not sure that they actually can. So I'm not sure exactly. It could be disinformation. Yeah. Well, not disinformation. It's just, you mm -hmm. know, a bad explanation. The I wonder PR if, is full of those all the time. Yeah, and I wonder if True. this is a Windows specific thing. I wonder if they even do can do this hmm. under, under the Linux client. That's yeah, a, like I wouldn't imagine there's some way to browse the dns cache on a linux client right yeah I, I i i'm not familiar but yeah it is it's very interesting so we'll keep following it we'll keep watching it i just they thought could, oh go ahead what, what, what thought they could have um something built into steam os now because they're rolling that out and i'm not sure if they've released open source code so i mean they right. could eventually build something hmm. into that i mean i think people be able to tell if they're you know they could look at the difference between the debian version of you know, libDNS or whatever it is versus the SteamOS version, uh, but it is it does it it you your your overall point is a good one in that them having their own operating system opens them up to the possibilities of just baking these kinds of nice little features in. It definitely makes you makes you take pause and go, okay, I do need to remember that Valve is a company and that they have their own motivations and that I need to be skeptical. And I think that's a good healthy thing for all of us to to think about right now. Uh, but it I, I definitely think so. I think one thing to remember, and, and first and foremost, never trust anything from any company. That's that's just a good rule of thumb. But that being said, I also look at motivation and how recent they are to a new market. Yeah. So I take Valve at like they're very recent to the Linux market, so they're pretty new here. Um, their motivation is to capture as many new users as possible, and so pissing people off early on probably isn't right. a real great game plan. Yeah. So based on those things at this point, I don't see anything with them doing anything nefarious at this point. I'll, that doesn't uh, mean in the future, but just saying. I, I'll link to Gabe's full post in the show yeah. notes, but one of the interesting things he said is that uh, this this little trick that they discovered, that they came up with, only worked mm -hmm. for 13 days until the cheat uh, authors... Um, came up with a new way to do it by purging oh, no. the DNS cache. Yeah, now the cheats <laughs> just purge the DNS cache, which wow. overall in impacts your uh, performance, so that kind of sucks, right. you know? Hmm. 
Uh, all right, Matt. Well, uh, we're going to talk to Michael Hall here in just a second about a really great post that he just had called uh, the new 8020 uh, open source. Uh, um, what did he call it? The hmm. let's see, he called it the uh, 80. Oh, the new the new 8020 rule for open source. Yes, uh, which was a great post. So we're going to talk to him here in just a sec. But first, I want to thank our second sponsor this week, and that is the amazing folks over at Ting. Now, I've told you a lot about Ting. Ting is mobile. It makes sense. It's no contracts. It's pay for what you use. But I actually thought this week, maybe I'd have one of their fantastic Canadians tell you a little bit about it. Ting keeps rates simple. We don't make you pick a plan. Instead, you just use your phone as you normally would. How much you use determines how much you pay each month. You can have as many devices as you want on one account. That's good, because when you use more, you pay less per minute, message, or megabyte of data. Your usage, plus $6 per active device on your account, plus taxes, is your monthly bill. Simple. That's what we mean when we say... Ting! Mobile. That makes sense. Yeah, so go over to uh, linux.ting.com to check them out. They've got a really awesome dashboard. I think all mobile carriers need to step up their game now. Ting has schooled everybody on how your dashboard should work. Web standards, so it works on your mobile device. It works on your desktop. They've also got iOS and Android apps to let you manage your account. You can set up call forwarding, voicemail options, stuff like that. They've got a really, really great customer service. You can call them at 1-855-846-4389. And if you call them during business hours... A real person answers the phone right then and there and takes care of your problem. They've got some videos on their blog, too, some behind-the-scenes uh, uh, videos on the crew that works in the support department, so you get a little idea of, uh, you know, and those, them Canadians, they're so nice, Matt. They're so right? nice. So right. they just posted one, I think, uh, today. Uh, yeah, today. Uh, yeah, I think, I think it was today. Yeah, so uh, that video is up on the Ting blog. While you're over at linux.ting.com, check out their savings calculator because Ting just dropped their rates. The Ting deal is even better for data now. So go over there, plug in your current bill information, and then just weep at the savings, my friends, because you'll be like, oh my God, it's so much better. And oh, there's no contract. Oh, I only pay for what I use. Oh, hotspot and tethering are included. Oh my goodness. By the way, they also have an early termination relief program. You can find out more about that at ting.com slash etf get started by going to linux.ting.com and that'll let them know that you heard about it right here on the unplug show you appreciate them supporting the unplug show and my friends it'll get you 25 dollars off your first device if you've already got a sprint compatible device and they've got a byod page that outlines everything well then good news they'll give you 25 dollars off your first month and if you're like me that actually ended up paying for my first month of ting and uh, I really love it. I just, uh, we were out. Um, I can say this now. Oh, I can talk about this now. Yeah, you can. So uh, Matt, Chase, and I were out in the car, right? <laughs> and uh, we're driving around and Chase doesn't have Ting, right? And because, uh, no. uh, you know, he originally had an iPhone and he wanted to, to he has another mobile carrier who likes to spy on you and give all your information to the government. And, yeah, they're great like that. Uh, extract as much money from you as possible. Anyways, that Absolutely. carrier uh, is pretty well known. So Chase says, well, let's do a speed test and see where we're at. And I, you know, so we both bring up the speed test app. You know, I had perfectly good pings, perfectly good speeds. And I'll tell you, I'm paying $33 a month. Chase is paying like $120 a month. We right. both have two phones on the account. So the, the value in Ting is just incredible. So linux.ting.com. And uh, thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. I'm just kidding, Chase. I know. <laughs> he's I, like, hey. Yeah, he's like, hey, come on now. Come on now. No, Chase, it's cool. It's cool, man. It's cool. All right. Well, uh, let me uh, bring Michael Hall into uh, the, our uh, restricted casting room here. And uh, Michael, welcome to Linux Unplugged. Thank you, guys. So you had a really great post this morning on your on your blog, uh, mhall119.com, and you said it's a new 80-20 rule for open source. So before we get into that, are, I noticed, are you trying to do like a blog a day kind of a thing right now? Yeah, there was uh, some conversation at the end of January about uh, the content going on Ubuntu Planet. And I came up with this, well, I didn't come up with it, I stole this idea of uh, doing a blog a day for a month. So you're and hoping so, to sort of populate the Ubuntu Planet with some reoccurring content every day kind of a thing? Yeah, I was just trying to get people to uh, kind of blog more actively on it. So what do you do at Canonical? Uh, well... As you mentioned earlier, my official title is uh, Upstream Liaison, but I really haven't been doing a lot of upstream liaison lately. I've been doing a lot of app developer focus. Uh -huh. Yeah, I bet. As you guys are ramping up the Ubuntu Touch effort, right? Yeah, and uh, the Ubuntu SDK. It's really uh, a lot of exciting stuff going on. What has got you most excited right now? Uh, the, everything around the, the app development and the phone. I mean, I've got a Nexus 4 that's running Ubuntu, and it's been my primary phone since August of last year. And uh, just the, the workflow 
using the phone is so much better for me than uh, than what Android mm-hmm. was. So is that really, I mean, the essence of that is, you know, because so many people when we talk about the, the mobile market, so many people talk about, oh, you know, Android's there, they're the new Windows, they're dominant, the market's all locked down, but are, you're telling me that you sit there, you're using this thing, you're like, you know what, this works for me, and that's what's got you excited. It's like, I, I see this fitting into my workflow, and, and do you think this is like a whole new generation of opportunity for Ubuntu? I think it is. I, the one the, the thing we have over everybody else in the market right now is that we're running the same software on the phone as we are on the desktop. So it's not like, you know, you've got completely different platforms like you do with the iOS and OS X mm-hmm. or even Windows and Windows Phone. And of course, you know, Android, there's not even anything on a desktop space with Android. There's Chrome OS. So being able to have just the one platform on all the devices, being able to have the same apps on all your devices is really, it really changes the experience of it. So uh, changing gears to your blog post here, I I know you've been, you've been active at Canonical for a long time. You've been in the open source community for how, do you have a rough estimation of like how long you've been in? Uh, I've been involved with the Ubuntu community for probably six, seven years now. Mm -hmm. And, and, so you've you've had time from that perspective to sort of notice trends as they come and go. You know the big the big hoopla's of the week that sometimes last multiple weeks, sometimes fizzle out fairly quick. Uh, and I thought you know you had a really poignant piece when you wrote here on your blog. Uh, people tend to appreciate it more when you only give them twenty percent of something, and then they resent you if you give them eighty percent. Um, let's let's unpack that a little bit. When you say people resent you, people people appreciate it more when you give them twenty percent. That sounds crazy to me. That sounds like that sounds ludicrous. What do you mean by that? Well, it, it does sound ludicrous, but what I realized is that at some point past the 50% mark, I just chose 80-20 because, you know, the 80-20 rule is a common thing. But at some point after you've given them more than half, people start to think of it as something that they're entitled to or something that already belongs to them. And so instead of looking at what you're giving them, they're paying more attention to what you're not giving them. Oh, interesting. So it's sort of like what Matt was saying. It's a, it's a, it's, it's one part expectations and two part. What have, what have you done for me lately? Yeah, it is. And as people have mentioned on my blog, there's another aspect of that, and that's you know what direction are you changing in? I mean, if somebody goes from giving ten percent to giving twenty percent, that's better than somebody who's gone from giving ninety percent to giving eighty percent. And that's a valid uh, uh, criticism of my original blog post is that the direction of change does matter as much as where you're currently at. Sure, sure. But I I think this is fascinating in the recent light of Firefox's announcement of enabling ads on their new tab page. Um, And part of it, like Matt made a very good point on last on Sunday, that part of it is honestly how they announced it. And part of it is... Um, I think what that the phenomenon that you're writing about on your blog is that, wait a minute, you're telling me I've gotten this thing all this time for absolutely free with no ads attached. You guys are the anti NSA, anti ad tracking cookie organization on the internet, and now you want to ram ads down my throat? How dare you? Um, this I, maybe while it doesn't surprise all of us, Michael, how do you how do you combat something like that? Because Firefox has got to make money. What can Firefox do? It's really a tough question. I mean, obviously, it's a question that we've been trying to figure out uh, in Canonical also. And I think a lot of it is getting the messaging right. But a lot of it is just the community needs to understand that every project's going to have missteps. And if somebody's been doing, you know, 80, 90 percent right for so long, you have to be a little more gentle when they have those missteps. Well, let me give you an example. So, um... Linux Unplugged, uh, this uh, very show that we are currently recording at this very moment uh, is is a symptom of this problem that you're talking about. Uh, I knew that I needed to make changes, um, even just from a creative expression standpoint, to the Linux Action Show. But I also knew that we had a really great product that was firing on all cylinders and has a ton of runway still. And I knew that if I changed that product to what this show is, there would be massive upset. Oh, yeah. And so my solution was to create an entirely new product. Now, that has been wildly successful on for multiple reasons, but it was exactly this kind of pressure. And we made the mistake years ago with the Linux Action Show 
when we decided to broaden the scope and change it to the computer action show. And we said we basically took a beating for an entire season over that decision because we had changed the product. And the problem is, is at some times, at some level, you've got to change the product. Apple, re- they changed the product with Final Cut. They changed the product with the Mac Pro, right? Two recent products from Apple that are used in professional industries, completely gutted and redesigned from the ground up with less functionality, but yet, in the long term, will probably be better off for it. As somebody who uses Final Cut for editing, I can tell you, everybody who uses Final Cut 10 is crap, hasn't used it recently. It's way, I just recently went back to the old Final Cut. It's like going back to the 90s. It's like when you've been using GNOME 3 and then you go, or Unity, and you go back to GNOME 2. It feels like you've gone back in time. And sometimes, a lopping off like this, a major change, in, implementing ads, implementing the Amazon search scope, is necessary for the sustainability of the project, the very people who depend on the project are then the ones that turn around on the project and attack them. What what can a project do, do you think, in your opinion, to communicate that change better so that way they can sort of preempt some of that attack? So a lot of it has to do with the messaging that goes into it. But uh, another thing that I've noticed that I didn't really expand on in my blog is that there's a different in, difference in reaction between people who are just users of the project and people who are contributors of the project. And people who are contributing seem to to be more understanding, mm. be more willing to work out an ideal solution instead of just jumping on the, oh my God, you're evil now bandwagon. So I guess what I don't understand is why can a company, just in my example I set up here, why can a company like Apple reboot something, cut away tons of functionality, and be called an innovator, but if an open source project does the same thing, they're crazy, they've lost their way, they're evil, they're, they're uh, whatever people are accusing Canonical or Mozilla of you know, that week. I, it seems to me, I mean, Canonical has people that deal with PR, they've got, they've got a pretty good presence online, and yet they have been unable to get in front of this. Mozilla, same thing, they have an entire, they have an entire crew that works there, and they were still unable to get in front of this. Matt, I want to ask you, because I know you've worked in this space before, what are these people missing? What, what is Mozilla missing in this case? What did they do wrong? What should they have done before the news came out? Well, the big big difference between like Mozilla and Apple is uh, is Apple sells experiences. Mozilla offers a browser. Um, a lot of people think that Apple is a computer company or a technology company. They're not. They're a PR company, pure and simple. They they've mastered this years ago, and so they could literally be like, "Hey, we have this we have this i home invasion thing where we're going to come in and basically invade your house and ransack everything you own." People are going to be excited about it because they can present it in a way that's attractive. What Mozilla needed to do when they came out with their whole their whole uh, advertising thing for browsers and whatnot is they really need to get in front of us and say, here's our rationale. Here's how we've been supporting ourselves thus far. Here's what we're challenged with. This is what we're planning on doing. We would like to have an open forum debate about this and actually get all the questions out in the, out, out in the open and really have a conversation about it. But at the same time, we need you to understand why we're doing it, why it is or is not a threat, why you should or should not be concerned, and to quit treating people like they need to be talked at hmm. and actually talk to them. That's something that Historically, geekier mm-hmm. companies don't do real well at Google, Mozilla, uh, two real big offenders in that space. Uh, probably Google being the worst. Um, you know, I, I see it over and over, and it's it's something that's not really addressed very well. So, um, yeah. and I and I've seen other companies do this as well. But I'd yeah. say, but Apple, they, honestly, as much as I'm not a big fan of their company, they can spin anything. Right, they control Seriously. the narrative from the very Absolutely. beginning. Absolutely, yeah. And 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 props to them for it. I mean, really, I mean, they know how to do it. And so, rather than everybody yelling at how horrible Apple is about it, let's look at what they're doing right. I mean, the products aren't kind of meh, but as far as their uh, marketing techniques, uh, come on, let's get with it. So, Michael, what do you think about like so if we if we don't have the means and resources of a company like Apple, you know, these smaller, you know, even Mozilla would fall into the smaller category. What about being just more direct? Like, uh, uh, and I'm not asking you as a representative canonical here. I'm asking just your personal opinion of somebody who's been following open source for many years now. Do you think that if a company like Canonical had come out and said, hey, we're doing these Amazon placements in our uh, dashboard results because honestly, we got to generate a revenue from the desktop in order to keep it sustainable. Or if Mozilla had come out, maybe let's take a more recent example. If Mozilla had come out and said, look, guys, we can't have all our eggs in the Google basket. We respect our relationship with Google and, we're th- and we appreciate the financing they've given us so far, but we've got to diversify because 
this browser is more important than one contract with one company and we've got to implement these ads to come up with a new source of revenue. If they had just been totally straight, plain, plain English like that, do you think things would have gone over better? I think it would have helped, but I mean, you're always going to have people who would rather see your project go down in flames than have you backtrack a little bit from their ideal. And you're, you're always going to deal with that. There's no way to explain things sufficiently for those people. Mm. But one thing we did do, you know, when we came out with the Amazon lens in 12.10, it just kind of landed out of the blue with no explanation of why it was there or what it does. And, you know, we're still dealing with that, you know, even today. But then the next release, we came out with the the broader smart scope service. Right. And, you know, we came out first with a, a public spec on our wiki. We held multiple uh, Google Hangouts that were recorded explaining what the feature was going to be and what it was going to do and how it's going to work. And the security and, improvements. Yeah, and yeah. the security improvements. And, and that certainly helped. I mean, if you can get the narrative right from the start that helps as soon as you know the fud comes in and establishes itself you're going to spend all of your time just trying Fighting to that. yeah just trying to fight that yeah great point uh that is boy that is a really well taken point and i, I wish yeah. there was a way to sort of reinforce this with the open source community because i'll give you a, a, another recent example i talked about on coda radio yesterday um uh, uh friend i want to say friend of the show although he's never come on i'd love to have him join us but martin who is responsible for the the kwin project uh, he continues to battle this problem. We talked about it several weeks ago here on the show where the media grabs a headline from the KDE mailing list and just runs with it. You know, first, we inaccurately reported that uh, the, um, the KDE next release date. But uh, more recently, and I, I, because of my lessons learned, did not run it in last, thankfully. But more recently, Pharonix ran a story that the, uh, the KDE search system it was a waste of money and that it's being abandoned in favor of something completely else, which is inaccurate in total. And of course, not everything's being abandoned. And of course, Recode's going to be repurposed. But again, they're fighting a, a battle that you just touched on, Michael, where they're responding to a narrative that somebody else created for them. And this is happening more and more for open source projects because, and this goes back to something else I've been really getting on recently, the coverage in Linux and the open source space is going downhill. It's becoming industrialized and it's it's becoming um, it's it's not original reporting. It's reposting based on what a corporation wants you to post, and it's getting worse. And 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 there's agendas involved, and it's getting to the point where the not all of the information is coming out, and the press is not giving the actual narrative a chance to get aired out. The only narratives that are getting repeated by the media are the ones that get created first. And this is a massive problem that is plaguing Linux and open source, and it affects the way the entire open source community perceives events, I believe. And I think it's one of the things that I want to set out to help correct on our platforms, any shows that we have, is that I, I want to try to give the actual real narrative a chance to get some airtime because nobody else seems to be doing it. And I, that's why I really, that's why I wanted to bring you on, Michael, because I really appreciate the fact that you're, even if, you know, there are some things I could disagree with on your post here and our, you've, you've actually generated a very active discussion on our subreddit. People are taking issue with uh, minimizing the CLA and things like that. Uh, but <laughs> I want to save the CLA discussion for a future episode. I'll just say, I want to thank you for bringing this topic out to a broader discussion because I think the problem really has to be solved with the actual consumers of these open source projects. It is our responsibility to consider the long-term viability of these projects. I extend that to our own projects and our advertisers and why we have ad, why we have ad supported media because that makes it sustainable. I think we have to consider the software we consider valuable and when they make changes, we have to understand that sometimes they're doing it for their best interest in the case of the Mozilla project and perhaps even in the case of the uh, the dash lens results. And I think in that context, your your post, while I think there's plenty of things people could quibble with, it definitely provokes some interesting thoughts. So thank you for coming on Linux Unplugged today. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on before we wrap up? No, I think that's it. As long as uh, we stay away from the CLA topic, I'm happy. Okay, all right, we'll stay yeah. away, and that's fair. Yeah, that's we'll fair. stay. We'll say we're gonna. I was actually I've been planning to save that for a future so, show. So what I'll do is I'll toss you up into uh, into uh, the main mumble room here. Now, uh, anybody in the mumble room, go ahead and uh, let let me know if you had anything you wanted to touch on this. But I wanted to zoom out as we kind of wrap up here, guys. Before we get to the uh, hard drive recovery thing that I want to get to before the show ends. 
Uh, what do you guys think? You know, looking at this, you've probably all witnessed these kinds of things where the community gets really upset about something that sort of is necessary. And I, I'm willing to say that perhaps I have been too critical of the Unity Dash results, especially now with the security improvements that have been made. You got to make something sustainable. What do you guys think? Chris, um, I want to take something actually Matt said and take it one step further when he was comparing Apple with open source companies specifically on this topic. Yeah. And that's Apple stands as like an authority. They make decisions and we don't have a choice in them. They're kind of like our parents in a way. There's nothing we can do. Whereas open source companies, we've helped them grow. We've helped nourish them over the years. So for us, they're more like friends. Um, we yeah. feel personally attached to these companies because we've been there from when Firefox started till now. Yeah. And in a way... Because we've been there for that long and we've been there to support them and nourish them, we feel like we have a personal stake, mm -hmm. not only in their successes, but also in their failures. Mm -hmm. And when they do make missteps, I think we kind of take it a little more personally because, you know, we want to be the open source, you know, banner of what's right. And when we see that, we see that as our community as a That's, whole faltering, yeah. not just Firefox. Faltering. And we invested our time and our energy because their ideals aligned with our ideals, Right. And so when those ideals deviate from our ideals, we feel a little bit robbed because that wasn't the original bargain. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So uh, go ahead, Crossroads, because you said it was bad enough when it was just Amazon. What did you mean? No, what I meant, to, what I meant was that it was bad when it was only Amazon because when it's only Amazon, then it appears as ads. Once they, uh, in 13.10, once uh, they had smart scopes right. and it covered plenty of sources, at that point, it became okay. Gotcha. Go ahead, Riley. Um, I think the thing is, is just ads itself. Ads are never never a cool thing, no matter what it is. I don't care who you are. Is if you say you're going to introduce ads, there's always going to be people who say no and scream right. at you. Like... I mean, you can all have the best PR in the world, but it's, like, if you yeah. introduce ads, it's still a bad thing to a lot of people, and there will always be those people who hate you for it. So, I mean, you just got to take that with a grain of salt. Like, if you win, you, I mean, you win up some and you lose some. So, right, yeah, okay. Well, I would, I would take that because I agree with that. Actually, I think that's a spot-on statement. I'd take it even further and say part of what Apple does to make their own uh, efforts successful too is that they're they're choosing their battlefield. So they're picking people that won't be as likely to object as folks that will um, by going to the tube TV versus uh, you know versus hmm. exclusively going online. Hmm. They're working with people that are already comfortable being bombarded with crap and uh, aren't going to uh, react as poorly. So well, it, I mean, so Ick, what do you think? You say maybe it's a necessary evil to have these ads. Absolutely, and the reason is is because people have to be able to make some sort of income. It doesn't matter if you are, you know, I've dealt with nonprofits for a good chunk of time myself in my professional career, and they have to have some income somehow. Um, the thing is, now, there is a line that can be drawn, and Lampy2 in the chat room did mention it, just don't track me. It's when you start getting followed around the internet and you're browsing. Yeah, that's exactly. when it's a line of privacy being crossed. Daredevil, do you think there's an alternative to ads? Yes, I think um, there's many models that um, that can work and then can put put into test. Um, ads has been the model that is mo mostly used because it reduces costs. And you can actually sell, even if you're selling something, you can sell it at a lower rate and expect to gain those profits mm. later. But I don't think it's the only model. And people should try look a little bit also and risk on models, business models, not only on development models, but business models as well. I kind of want to dovetail on that a little bit because you know, we're, we're still within that topic. Um, when I was... You know, uh, looking at what Firefox is doing, you know, they're getting most of their income from uh, Google. Well, what if Google decides to pull out on that agreement? Right. Yeah. Right. Then exactly. they have to come up with their revenue some other way. And, you know, the thing is, they're only getting 1%, of, actually less than 1% of their revenue from donations. So that's right. That right. Yep. becomes a problem when you're not going to make be making as much money to be all your developers. Very true. I, I uh, think Mozilla is um, going to have hate thrown at them, like, either way. So really, like Apple's done, is they actually make the... Um, they actually just make the product, throw it out there, see how it sells, and 
could just go with that, like gnome in a way. So Daredevil, and I know you know the. So I'll tell you, uh, you think maybe donations aren't the model, but God, don't we all want them to be? Don't you want the people who are consuming the thing to be the people who finance the thing? What are your thoughts? Yes, um, I I think exactly that. And actually, for example, I quite appreciated when when Ubuntu had this um, button that you when you were to download, you could actually yeah. vote with your wallet right. where the money goes. Yeah. To. And I think that's actually much better. And let's say you make uh, three months or uh, just a, a limited time where people get this, they can get the source code as well while they download and they get the, the paid version. They just pay for the product. It's a license. And then after that time, it actually gets released for everyone. And yeah. that's another model, for, for instance. Now, Mr. Hall, I know you had a response to Art of Music's point. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned that you know the the Apple approach is to just throw something over the wall and, and be done with it that way. And I think part of what I wanted to stress in my blog post was that is if we keep going after the companies that are doing mostly right so harshly, we're going to drive more people in the opposite direction. That we're going to drive them to the Apple approach where they just throw it out there and say, "Here it is, use it or or don't." Good point. Now, Riley, uh, I wanted to shift gears to you because uh, I know you had an idea about a Mozilla service. Tell me about this. Yes. Um, how about instead of like, maybe ads, how about you start offering some like streaming services or cloud storage services, like things like that you can draw in revenue from, like subscription based hmm. type things, maybe. For the sync or something. Well, I'd say privacy services would probably be the yeah. most logical, yeah. of course. Exactly. Yeah. Like I mean, the VPN service. People, that would be excellent. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. People have a trust there. Uh, I don't know. I think I kind of fall down with you, Crash Benedict. Uh, Crash Bandicoot, you say, you say, hey, Opera, Safari, they've oh, these guys have been doing this since day one. But how yeah, successful well, I mean, are they? The, the actual proposal that they made was that on a, on a brand new install of Firefox, you know, you get the new tab page with the nine squares on it. All they're going to be doing is giving companies the ability to be put on that before the user has actually filled that up with their own things. So if, until you visited your first nine websites on a brand new install, you're going to see those defaults. Right. But then eventually you would even replace them with your own sites that you frequent. Exactly. And I mean, I recall installing Opera way back when this is like five, six, seven, eight years ago. And they had, you know, the, the page with all the different tiles on it. And when you install it, you'd open it and they'd have links on that to Facebook and Google and YouTube and whatever, yeah, Wikipedia and yeah. stuff like that. It was just it was just some default sites that they suggest to you. And the mobile uh, mobile Firefox does the same thing. When you open it for the so, first time, it has some default things. See, this goes, this goes to Michael's point is I think if, if Firefox – I mean, tell me if I'm wrong here, Michael, but if Firefox had – shipped the browser from day one when they had invented this new tabs page the first time it went out if they just signed up agreements and populated it no one would give a crap that's after that's it right nobody would care it would not even be a topic of discussion but because they're changing the deal after we've already all made the deal after we've all done some sort of imaginary handshake now it's a big deal now we're all upset now we're all buttered instead we'd rather they have some sort of deal with google but God forbid they make money directly. I, I, I prefer that, to be honest with you. I prefer that they're not attached to Google at the hip. Maybe someday we'll see DuckDuckGo as the default search if they're not getting $300 million a year from Google. Maybe right. DuckDuckGo gets product placement now. I mean, I think this is, could be a really good thing. Oh, I don't know. Hey, why don't we, uh, why don't we solve Joey's uh, hard drive problem before we get out of here? He writes right. and he says, uh, all right, he says to start, I'm a complete newbie to using Linux. I'm a 50-year-old systems analyst who has worked in Windows world for a long time. A year or so ago, I got hooked on the Linux Action Show, so I decided to try Linux. I've got a couple old Dell D3 uh, 630s, one with KDE, and the other partitioned with Maya and Ubuntu. So far, my experience has been absolutely positive, and I kick myself for not trying Linux sooner. So, I have a ton of questions, but the most pressing is regarding an issue I ran into a couple of months ago while updating Ubuntu. I mentioned earlier that I have Ubuntu and a Mint slash Maya on this machine. During the update, the hard drive crashed, and now I'm getting bad sector messages when I try to boot up Ubuntu. 
I can still boot up my Mint with no problem, and I'd like to see if any of my data on the Ubuntu partition is retrievable. I realize this is a hardware issue related. It's related to a hardware issue and not, and it's not changed my mind about learning about Linux at all. However, I can't seem to find a way to access the partition from the Mint partition. If it's not possible, then so be it. I sincerely apologize for my lack of knowledge and if I've used any incorrect terminology. I hope that you have not mm. known you with my lengthy message. Your assistance and advice is most appreciated. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, boy, I... Well, Gosh, uh, I read that two, last paragraph and I get a little worried. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, f- the f- first and foremost, I mean, you know, w- when in doubt, do hard drive, obviously. I guess uh, outside of that, maybe a file system check of some, you know, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, R- Riley's got his, yeah. Riley, what do you think? You, I think you're going to recommend one of my favorite tools, aren't you? Yeah, it's a uh, system rescue CD. You actually have a lot of tools where you can um, oh. check and clean your hard drive out. So There you go. He should be seeing the hard drive and partitions from his Mint installation. And that makes me think that it's really real bad. It's real yeah. bad. Yeah, if it's that, then there's not much you can do, unfortunately. But if there's uh, just a couple bad sectors, and System Rescue can help with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Sounds to me like he may have lost his uh, this root file system, what have you, yeah. on the hard drive. You know how it's yeah. set up. Yeah. Yeah. So it's beyond file system check at that point. That, so, it, yeah. it, it sounds bad. So what he needs to do is he needs to get a list of the drives attached and their partitions. And the other thing he could try doing is he could try installing. I would recommend, we, we did an episode on this. Uh, it doesn't quite show in the window, but it's called DD Rescue. And oh, we, yes. did, we did an episode of Linux Action Show on this uh, a while back. So uh, you can find that if you, uh, uh, if you dig around. But DD Rescue, it's a data recovery tool. And what's great about DD Rescue is is that uh, it it will perform like a soldier. It will read and read and read and read that bad sector for as long as it possibly can, every single block, man, and it will read and read and read it. And, and what the way it does it is it will take a pass at your hard drive and it'll get everything it got on that first pass. And then it'll go back and get the next pass and then the next pass and the next pass. And it'll keep going and keep going and keep going for as long as you really want it to. I mean, it will go for a really long time. And it can spit that out to an image file that you can then look at later on. So that might be something you want to look into. Um, and uh, there you go. The random person in the chat room just linked uh, the uh, the video. I'll put a link to that in the chat room. Or I mean, I'm sorry, in Chris, the show notes. Yeah. Um, one suggestion I have, and it might sound a little bit extreme, but it's worked for me, is when my, I had a 500 gig drive that wasn't readable at all in BIOS or in the system. So I threw some Googling on and I ended up putting in a Ziploc bag and oh. putting it in the freezer yeah. for like yeah. a couple of days. Yeah. And then it actually read it for a limited time but, before it heated up to normal operating temperature, so I could at least pull some files that I needed off. It's not a hundred percent foolproof, though. It that sounds help. like a last ditch effort. Yeah, that yeah, should be a last ditch yeah. effort, if ever. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty much my last ditch effort yeah. since it was a power search that happened on my drive. So hold on, I'm gonna play this clip. Let me see here. You're seeing timeout errors on SDA, whatever. Right. You're getting you're getting error messages on there. There's some red flags are being thrown up at you. Maybe like when you mount the drive, your system kind of locks up for a little bit. These are all indications that yeah. drive is it's going out. That's you need right. to get the data off there real quick. That's where an open source program called DD Rescue comes in. Mm-hmm. Now here's what's great about DD Rescue. You're familiar with DD, I would Absolutely. assume, right? Uh, DD Rescue is DD for data recovery, and I'll link to a, a, a walkthrough video. You guys can see uh, how this how this process works when you're recovering data on a drive. But think of DD Rescue as like this: it okay. it you start it on a drive, and you can you can assign it some thresholds and some variables. Mm-hmm. And what DD Rescue's essential mission is is it tries to rip through that drive from one end to the other end as fast as possible. And as it goes, every time it hits a bad sector, it marks it along the way, and then it just keeps going, and it writes all this to a raw image file. So you need to store that raw image file on a different drive. I have the syntax for this in the show notes. Um, and then, as it finds these errors, once it gets to the end of the drive, it then loops back, and depending on how many times you've told it in the command line mm-hmm. flag, it then once again tries to get those bad sectors. And it'll try, you know, so say you oh, say right. set it for three times. It'll try, it'll go through, go through all of them again. Almost, it, you know, I should just play old clips of us all the time. I mean, that was exactly what I just said. So that was a Linux Action Show Season 27, Episode 10. Uh, if you want to check that out. Sorry, Mumble, yeah. you couldn't hear that. I was playing on your channel. But, Joey, good luck with that. And uh, so check out uh, that episode. We'll have it linked in the show notes. We've got a couple other tools in there. And I think I totally agree with Riley, too. This is, uh, the System Rescue CD has got to be one of the greatest little pieces of... I, I always have a copy in my bag. Whenever I was work- going to a client, always had a copy of it. So uh, very cool. Good stuff. All right. Well, uh, you know, I want to say thank you to Michael for coming on Linux Unplugged today. Uh, it was great having you here. 
And uh, yeah, thanks thanks for having that was me. awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. And you are welcome to come back and join our mumble room anytime. We always have it open during Linux Unplugged. So if there's anything on your mind you ever want to share, we'll give you a little slot. You come on the show. We'd be happy to have you. And also, we'd love to have you join us live. Why don't you come over live? Join us at jblive.tv. We start at 2 p.m. Pacific. And uh, you can also get that in your local time zone over at uh, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. And guess what? I really love to hear your feedback. You know, you might you might have noticed this, but Matt and I, we start every single episode of Linux Unplugged with your feedback. That means we need your feedback. That's how it works. Ish. That's the math of it. So go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and click that contact link and send something into us. We'd love to hear it. Now, Matt. Yes. Uh, we have a surprise. I, we are scheduled to talk with uh, some of the folks from the Numix project. They are setting out to make the GNOME desktop even more beautiful with an with a complete theming package that I've been using for a couple of weeks. It's really elegant. It's really amazing. And I want to talk to them about making the Linux desktop look better and make it look even just more incredible. And that's what they're working on. So they'll be joining us on Sunday. Right but, on. But, uh, you know, I... That doesn't mean we're not we're gonna have a great show next. Did Linux Unplugged? We got a great show planned for that too. So don't worry, everybody. All right, Matt, have a great week. I'll see you on Sunday, okay? All right, see you soon. All right, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. We'll see you right back here next Tuesday. Mm-hmm.